I'm Lisa Dale Miller. Welcome to part two of my dialogue with David Vago on the neurobiology and psychology of enlightenment. David is associate psychologist in the Functional Neuroimaging Laboratory at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and he's also an instructor at Harvard Medical School. Good to see you again, David. It's wonderful to be with you again, Lisa. David, you formulated a beautiful framework called SART for describing the positive effects of Buddhist-derived meditation practices. SART delineates four primary areas in which these effects are realized. Increased meta-awareness, greater response regulation, a sense of self-transcendence, and improved pro-social skills. So before we dive more deeply into not-self, would you start us off with a quick overview of SART's relevance as a model for neurobiologically and psychologically describing the states and traits we might associate with awakening? If we just refer to mindfulness really as the entire dharma, really, or the Buddhist meditation practices that, that are used for systematic mental training, um, for reducing suffering and, and sustaining a healthy mind, then you know, we have to think about um, operationalizing some of the uh, factors that um, produce change. You know, what is it that's this, what's transforming in mind, brain, body, yeah. in the practitioner? And so we focused on identifying, uh, using the self and identifying neural networks in, uh, in the brain related to self-processing. Um, to pr 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 uh, pr create a framework for how uh, these meditation practices are self are transformative, and we think they're transformative in ways that can be measured in the networks uh, that represent self processing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where we started um, this whole process of SART, and so SART really is a way to describe sort of the general framework for self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence, and we operationalize those terms in, in, in a particular framework. I refer to a number of factors that you see in the Buddhist text. So just as a summary, um, you know, self-awareness really refers to uh, an unbiased form of awareness of yeah. self, others, and one's relation to the world. And I always show this picture of a cat, you know, looking in the mirror and seeing a lion. And, uh, you know, in, 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 in this regard, it really refers to, you know, your version of reality and how your entire worldview can be distorted without you even having any knowledge that, it, that it's distorted in some way. And... Um, that distortion of your own perception and evaluation of the world, and I break it down into a time frame. Of, you know, if you think of every moment of existence, of your existence, uh, as around 500 milliseconds in time, and you have sort of these sort of string, a string of me, a string of me and my and mine um, types of rep, uh, uh, relationships over and over again, and then you can break that down, that 500 milliseconds down into the first half, which is based in sensory and perceptual processing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, zero to about 250 milliseconds long. And that happens all underneath awareness. And then 250 to 500 milliseconds, their cognition begins. Mm -hmm. And you start to evaluate the world. And so the distortions that we see and the biases that we see, the maladaptive habits that we have in terms of our worldview, you know, whether it's, you know, our, our fears, our um, expectations, our wants, our attitudes, our values, our self-image, all of these things create a worldview. And all of that is distorted by uh, what happens um, from time now to uh, time pl now plus x mm -hmm. or time now minus x. Uh -huh. Everything that's happened up to this point in time is a string of perceptions and evaluations. And the more times that you have a particular distortion 
uh, that's going to become more and more heavily conditioned uh, into a more um, uh, enduring trait or habit of mind. You can have a totally different perception and evaluation of an experience um, than somebody who's in the same exact room as you having the same uh, experience happen around them. So you put two people in a room and then you ask them what happened and there's going to be different stories. Um, so aside from our fallibility of just uh, recounting or retrieving a, a, a previous memory, um, there is just a distortion in how we perceive the world. And it can be negatively skewed if everything's negative and it's constantly uh, associated with anger, frustration, sadness. Um, that's conditioning itself. So everything that's contextually relevant to every moment that happens is going to be then associated with those negative interpretations and, and perceptions. In terms of self-awareness, the idea of these practices is to, well, first settle the mind. Mm -hmm. The idea is let's calm it down first. Let's make sure that you can have the focus necessary to gain insight into what those habits are. Mm -hmm. And once it's settled, then we can gain insight and look in and see self-reflection. So bhavana, right? The bhavana is the, mm -hmm. it's the form of develop, cultivating familiarity yes. uh, with one's mind. That's the essence of the meditation practice, to settle it down and gain insight. So once we have that insight, we can see things more clearly. I mean, that's the way it's described in the Buddhist text, correct? Mm -hmm. Right, so it makes sense intuitively as, uh, as a form of introspection to just look within and get a better, more accurate sense of what your mental habits are. And you may not have direct insight into what's happening beneath awareness at the perceptual level, right. but certainly you could influence what happens at that level by modifying how you react to thoughts and emotions that arise how you can examine them a little bit more without the reactivity, without the immediate reaction, um, and with more just curiosity. And just through awareness, uh, the idea at least is that you can change those, those habits into more adaptive ones, ones that are going to be better for you. We're not very good at, at, uh, at knowing ourselves, as, as you may think you are. You may think you have good insight into who you are and how you behave, but actually, it's, uh, uh, we're quite uh, biased, and, and we're, um, our perception of ourselves is a little bit distorted. So the practice is supposed to help us gain insight. Number one, self-regulation refers mostly to what we're used to hearing. It's the clarity that develops yes. in one's insight and towards one's mind. And that comes from training the mind in a systematic way to per, uh, to stop it from being quite impulsive uh, and from uh, being distracted. Okay, so having the monkey mind, keeping it clear and calm and concentrated. So there's the regulation piece. Uh, what do we mean by transcendence? At least in this context, in the SART model, uh, we're talking specifically about um, self-processing and transcending self-focused needs and wants and desires. Mm -hmm. It's about developing a relationship between self and other and, uh, and the rest of the world, and how you relate to others. It's things like improving empathy, improving theory of mind. So really just the ability to put yourself in the shoes of others yes. and then connecting uh, in a heartfelt way with other people. Mm -hmm. So all together, self-awareness, self-regulation, and self-transcendence create this framework by which these meditation practices are working to reduce suffering and create a healthy mind. And, I, and, and I'm not ambiguous about what suffering is. I try to be very explicit mm -hmm. from the Buddhist point of view and from the Western uh, psychological models of what we can think of as suffering. Why does psychopathology originate? 